how you doing? My name is T.M. Stevens. Generally, the band travels in a limo. I travel in the back of the van with the equipment. I want to welcome you to my world. I think I hear some music. Do you hear some music? Stay tuned. You're watching T.M. Stevens' instructional video. Come on inside. Check this out. Check this out. T.M. Stevens, glad you're aboard. Thank you for purchasing my video. Today, we're going to cover a lot of ground. And while we're at it, wait a minute. How? Yow, hey! Ow. I'm back. So, sit down, relax, and we will take you through a journey on the final frontier of base. The final frontier. the old early years oh, yeah well <clears throat> when I first started I started playing at 11 years old and uh, back then if you couldn't play uh, anything funky you just couldn't hang out you know so in the early years I started out with the R&B and I began to buy records by Mahavishnu Orchestra back then I bought records Miles Davis and incidentally I ended up playing with all of those people I think it must have been a, uh, a good accident, but it was wonderful. So uh, my early years, I went out on the road playing with Stacy Lattisaw, which was more of an R&B act. And then somehow I got picked up by Norman Connors and Pharaoh Sanders, who's a jazz horn player. And from there, I went into jazz and fusion with uh, Ma Vishnu, Al Demiola. We opened for Billy Cobham. And uh, my first official band was Narda, Michael Walden who also played with, with Mahavishnu. So it was very interesting. And I would do a Broadway play in which I met Narda Michael Walden uh, because it was across the street from the Professional Percussion Center. And uh, Narda said, would you come and play with me for half the money? And I said, I'm an artist first. So I left the play. I left the security and went on the road in the station wagon. And I've been gone ever since. Yeah. Um, my musical influences started out when I was very young with the Reverend Jimi Hendrix. And the very first songs I ever played was a James Brown piece because I learned to play bass actually in Harlem, which is on 131st Street, which is Small's Paradise. And back then there was big jazz artists playing every, every like night, and I would go down and listen to what they did. So at an early age, I was actually influenced by jazz, later to be influenced more by rock and roll and soul. But soul was my first thing, which is the Motown era. James Jameson 
was uh, one of the famous bass players that played with the Jackson Five and you name it, Four Tops. And his style of bass playing is very rhythmic, but extremely complex, off the root notes, which we'll get into later in the video. Larry Graham was another one of my, one of my favorite influences. He's the bass player from Sly and the Family Stone. And he initiated the thumb technique. There's a, a lot of controversy about who invented thumb. Larry Graham, I just want to say officially invented the thumb playing. Uh, other players, like I said, Jimi Hendrix influenced me. Jimmy Page with Led Zeppelin was a big influence because of his originality. Sly and the Family Stone. Um, I like Metallica too. And um, as we go on in the video, I'll tell you a few more. But those are my basic influences. And of course, Miles Davis and early jazz because of the experimentation. Right now, I want to talk about the absolute basics of this instrument. To play all of the, the pyro type things, that is to say all of the fancy techniques and fast playing and all the innovations that we will cover a little later that you can do with this instrument, we'd like to talk about the basement, which is what you need to actually put your house on. If you have no basement, then your house will collapse. All right, let's start with how to hold the instrument. Um, some players like Anthony Jackson, a very good player, great player, friend of mine, he actually sits and if you can see, he plays basically with his arm braced over the base thusly and his fingers and wrist are curved. And the fingers are actually in this angle, to the side, not necessarily straight, but to the side. In this hand, you have to pretend that you have sort of a baseball or an egg in your hand, hence it's curved. This prevents you from getting cramps or cramped too easy. So if you can see it, I'll come this way. This is the correct position on the base. Okay. When you're playing, in the, actually in the finger positions, you want to spread your fingers so that if you're in, say, the key of C, that all four fingers are covering four frets. <laughs> thusly and backwards. Some of us, and a lot of players and myself when I first started used to play things where we would go this way, slide this way, this way, this way, and mix the fingerings up. When you, when you actually put your fingers in the right position, you're able to get a bit more speed and accuracy. Okay, next it's your thumb, it should be against the bass in such a way where it's supporting your fingers. Some players tend to play with their finger this way. You're not in a good position to actually hit with accuracy on a lot of the frets. So you don't want to play this way. You want to play more this way. Okay? Next, I'd like to cover how you hold the instrument in the standing position. Now, I'm a big Jimmy Page fan, so, and I'm also very tall, if you haven't noticed. My arms are very long. Most players tend to play with the bass and a strap real tight up in this position. This is actually comfortable and better for you to see if you're able to look at the instrument and play, it, and play different notes. In my case, because of my reach, I probably should have been a basketball player, I like it down here. Okay, and sometimes even lower. So when I'm playing, I don't like to bend my arm, I like to stretch it. So now I'm actually in a comfortable position as if I were walking, and I'm able to play. Okay. Next we'd like to demonstrate, or I would like to demonstrate, finger technique. Some bass players, Great bass players actually play with a pick to get a plectrum sound or more of a... In my particular case, I use the fingers for that and I've never played with a pick uh, because for my taste, I like the sound of actually fingers on the strings. So what I do is I practice if, say, we choose a note like uh, C sharp for no other reason. I'll take my fingers. If you can watch, I'll do it real slow. 
I'll count in 16 notes. One E and a. Uh. One E and a. Uh, two E and a. Uh, three E and a. Uh, four E and a. Uh. This is very important, and it's very important to actually do it by metronome so that your playing is very even with your fingers. Most of the groove, if not 90% of it, will come from this hand, these fingers. These fingers will actually play the notes and cause your mutes, which I'll show you. A mute would be, and in funk music, muting is extremely, extremely important. So back to this hand for now. We'll go back to that. So what I do, my way of practicing, is I'll start real slow. One E and a, two E and a, three E and a, four E and a. And that causes my fingers to be a bit more consistent and even in volume on both fingers. The next step on this would be to, to play it and then play the octave, which is the up. One E and a, two E and a, three E and a. And that gets you used to actually moving your fingers across the strings as well as here. Each day, I try to speed that up. So by the end, hopefully, you're able to play more. The first exercise, the second exercise. Now what that does is it makes your playing very even. And when you're in a studio, like we are here, actually, uh, we're going to record our record here, and I've done Joe Cocker here. Um, that makes your playing a lot more even so that you're not going, and you don't have dropouts. You want to make sure that the bass is very even, and when you want dropouts, that they're there. So you need control on your hands. That brings me into the next technique. Larry Graham um, actually invented the thumb. Many uh, <clears throat> young players coming up today really like the thumb. So how I do it, most players will tend to play with the thumb in the upright position and then plucking with the index finger. In my technique, I have to play in the down position because I'm always switching between the thumb and the fingers. So in the case, we'll, we'll take it to E. I'll go. <laughs> If you notice, I'm plucking, I'm pluck, actually plectruming. Then I switch to the fingers. Then I go back to the thumb. Some players will play the entire thing on the thumb. But I tend to like the warmth of fingers, which is why I don't play with a pick. So, again. If you notice, I'm switching in the middle. And to me, that gives two different complete sounds, but it makes a real unique sound, and it's my sound to do it that way. So in the thumb, I play this way. Now, in thumbing, it's almost as if you're playing drums. So when you're, when you're actually going to thumb, don't worry about sounding notes over here. Get your rhythms together here. Again. It's actually taking the beats of the drum and applying them to the bass. Hence, the bass will be what's known as a rhythm instrument and a melodic instrument. So you're playing the melody. All right? All right. Now, while you're playing your rhythms, you want to just not only play that rhythm, you want to be able to play different rhythms. So here. So what I'm doing is I'm complying and applying different kinds of polyrhythms within this hand, and this hand then attains all of the notes. I think lastly I'd like to talk about the bass is harmonics. Um, Jocko actually made the harmonic playing very, very famous, and I love Jocko's playing. Again, I will back off the pickup to the back pickup so I c you'll be able to hear them clearly. That's a very famous major seven type chord. Major 7 9 and um, any uh, actually the five string bass solo, the eight string bass solo, you'll I uh, play this particular type of feel. 
So harmonics can be done in many different ways. The way Jocko basically applied them were, were in textual ways. Now what I did is I took the same technique, the same way of playing the harmonic, and I took it and made it into a bit of a more rhythmic type thing. So if I were to take his harmonic, the major seven and E, take this chord, take this chord, I generally make a rhythm out of it, hence. Now what that does, obviously you can hear, I don't really need a band to play this way, and this is how I play solo. So what's going on in this hand is I'm playing the two and four of the drums, the snare drum. Two, four, one, two, three, four, and I'm also playing a, a 16th pattern. Okay, you hear it, one, two, three, four, and one he and a two, he and a three, he and a four, he and a one, he and a two, he and a three. Two, four, in this hand, I'm playing the chords and the melody. Hence, you get the drums, you get the chords, and you get the bass. One more time.
people ask me that when you work with so many different artists from Billy Joel to Steve Vai to James Brown even. In fact, this very room here is where we did Unchain My Heart with Joe Cocker. Uh, that was about six years ago. We came in here and I'll tell you how Unchain My Heart happens, which answers your question. Um, Unchain My Heart is a Ray Charles tune and it was a blues tune. And um, he said he wanted to do something different with it. Well, it's because I knew how to play more Sly and the Family Stone from playing in bands like that. I started playing a Larry Graham style, and thus it was a big hit. So playing with so many different musicians and musics, it's like vocabulary. Each time I play with someone, I add to my technical ability. I add to what I already know. And some people say, well, when you play with Miles Davis, and then play with Joe Cocker, are you selling out? I say absolutely wrong, absolutely not, because while I'm with Joe Cocker, I'm still taking what I learned with Miles with me to Joe Cocker. So I don't subtract, I'm ad addition. So I wish today that um, the young players had more opportunity to play many different things. But today the industry is very separate. So if you're playing grunge, you have to play only grunge or only rock, only R&B. When I started, you played everything or you don't eat. In this segment of the video, I'd like to talk about the various styles that I'm called upon to do in any given week or any given record or project. Um, for the most part, um, if you're playing in a grunge band or heavy rock band, you generally play mostly in that style of music, especially the way the market is today in marketing. But when you do sessions and different projects, you're, you're expected to know a lot of different things and different ways to play. So we'll just cover a few of these here. And uh, we also have some special guests in, in the house, and we'll demonstrate that actually in an ensemble situation. But let's start with, um, well, say Joe Cocker. Um, with Joe Cocker, he plays a bit of a pop, but it's a pop rock. And uh, in this very room, we uh, created Unchain My Heart. And basically his, his style was a bit of a Larry Graham, Sly and the Family Stone type of style, which is more of a funk rock mixed with a pop change. So you would take your thumb and So with him, I would do stuff like that, and then I would even it out and start playing it more of an eighth note feel with the fingers, which is more in pop music. And if I were playing this thing with, uh, say, Brian Adams, which we did play, When the Night Comes, his is not more of a, which is more of a skip. His thing would be more of a... So basically what I'm saying is with the fingers, you can play eighth, note, eighth notes, and if you play like the one, six, four, five type progressions, then you have more of a pop. So you have a... Which can be a losing you. So that is one style, actually in the pop idiom. And another way I can play pop is actually with a hint of reggae. Because today in reggae you have a lot of bands like the B-52s that are playing that a lot. You have, um, I mean, it's just endless. And so what you do is you take the, the melody and you use it on the upbeat or what they call a checka, man, which is a upbeat. And in the bass, what it does, it speaks and waits for an answer. So you have sound in space. So let's pretend that I have the guitar, and you have, and the bass will go. So basically what that is without all of the chaka is the bass would play, say, a melody on its own, and it would stop, so one. Wait.
And that would be what I would also apply in pop. Or I would take an octaver and... Rest, rest. So in the reggae idiom, especially in pop, when you play and you rest, that is basically how you create that effect. And so I showed you before how I play with the thumb and alternate it with the fingers. In these idioms, I'll tend to play more bigger lines and more, I'll just do it for you. So you take a line. Uh, all right. And I told you about the 16 notes. So in my head, I'm thinking, while I'm playing this way, I'm thinking, one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four. E. Hence, you get that funk. Then I just take it and rock it out a bit and add some attitude to it. And hence, you get how. So that is mostly in the attitude. It was the same notes that I played, but I played them very hard and very heavy. And in most of your grunge musics, and musics in that idiom, which is heavy, is played with that attitude. So if you're playing more of actually a Phrygianist type of thing. Those are still the same eight notes that I played for Brian Adams, if you remember, when I was playing but only now I'm playing it much harder with much more noise and I'm playing it much more. So it's actually the same technique just played with a different attitude. And sometimes I've been called on in the old days, which is one of my greatest heroes, uh, which is James Jameson. And he actually initiated the Motown sound which is actually taking the thirds and the tenth um, and just doing different things and changing the root notes sometime. And what I mean by that is you count the scales. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's actually a tenth or a third. So if I were playing in that idiom, which is more of a Motown thing, So you would begin to drop the tenths or drop down to the lower third. And that was the great music of James Jameson, especially when he played all of those, you know, whatever it is, I'm not playing right. Now he wouldn't put a pop in there, of course, but I will take things and TMIs them, that's what I call it. So I will basically bastardize the style. But I think in order to be able to play the musics of today and to be considered a bass player with groove, you have to go back to the Motown, even back to Delta Blues, so you can get your roots and get your basement to be able to play the styles today. Um, another style is act actually a picking style, and I told you before I don't use a pick, so I use my fingers in this. And that's if you were to put a little bit of chorus on there. And what I do is, is called a stutter funk, and I mute the string. So if I'm playing, all right, so what I'm doing is basically muting the string here and taking my fingers and using the picking or the plectrum. So I showed you that before. And that also works in a lot of the musics that I'm playing now in terms of when I'm playing, say, for instance, on a funk gig that's not quite R&B. So you'd have a... And what I do also a lot of is I play harmonic chords to give the effect of almost a piano or a guitar. 
especially if the guitar player is soloing. In the case of Stanley Jordan, who you will see later in this video, uh, he tends to dominate all of those things by playing both patterns. But if he so chooses to go off on a solo, I'm able to cover the chords. So I'll demonstrate that again with a little bit more chorus. And the way that's played is that pretend he's soloing, I would go more those chords. Now, that means that the soloist is not missing anything in the bottom, whereas if I were to just play it, it's a bit empty, which is sometimes okay, all right? But when I add the harmonic, that gives him a lot more excitement to go off of. Um, the last style I get called to play sometimes is, especially in jingles, they're very simple styles. And more or less, you can take a simple line, but if you have the groove, and I told you the groove is the most important thing, you can make the most simplest thing actually talk. So I take all the effects off, no effects, and let's just say you want to play. All right, that's a simple line. Apply the 16th note thing. One E and a two E and a three E and a four. Put in your brain, and you have. So you're taking basically a simple line and making it into something. Now, if you take the James Jamison thing, here's another thing. You can also go. So what I'm trying to say to you in summation, all the different styles doesn't mean that you're trading off or you're selling out on one thing. You're only adding to your vocabulary. So I would recommend that you all listen to everything. Listen to your favorite guitar players, bass players, and heroes. And once you've actually taken that in, forget it. And what I mean is forget it. Don't try to emulate. Come out with it your way. But take all the styles. Now we come to the part of what I call FX, or special effects. Uh, in my band, Out of Control, um, I spend a lot of time doing the lead vocals. So I set up what is known as a po actually a pedal board. And it's a homemade pedal board, but it's very compacted for me to be have e easy touch to it. And I don't have to really look at the, the effects while I'm singing, because I'm mostly in a mic. So first, um, there have been a lot of enhancements and advancements in the bass guitar itself, both technically and sonically. So what we've done is, in the past, uh, mostly guitar players and keyboard players used effects like wah-wahs and vibroluxes and things like that on their instruments, and the bass was pretty much straight and flat. Today now, uh, the bass guitar has been involved with special effects to create different sounds. You want to alter the sound of your instrument while not exactly leaving what it is. You, the timber is bass, but you want to add certain things. The way I use my special effects, or stomp boxes, or whatever you want to call them, um, I use them like seasoning. If you're making a, a plate of spaghetti, you wouldn't just put a whole bunch of oregano and keep pouring it. What I do is I season it. I put a little bit of wah, that's enough, a little bit of octaver, a little bit of this, and in the end, hopefully the piece of music I've painted it, uh, very much like Picasso. You put a little green, a little orange, a little gray. So I will show you what these effects are that I use on the floor, and I, I have a great deal more in my rack. But I, I've chosen these effects because I don't like to depend on them. This is important. If you become the Wawa king, which is OK, but you can't play your instrument without it, then I think you need to rethink this. This is only an addition to. This is important, I'll repeat it. These effects should add to your playing, not be your playing. Let's start. First, this colorful device here is a Morley Wah Wah pedal. And basically, we call it the Wappin. And why they call it that is because if you've been watching throughout the video, I have very colorful basses. And we call them the weapons. It's just a slang. So they decided to call this a Wappin and put a peace sign on it. 
This wah-wah pedal has a bit of a, a lighter tone. So when you wah, it has a wider band, which means it goes wah and closes. Some wahs, just like the Vox, or actually the Crybaby, are shorter, and they're better for guitar. So for the bass guitar, I choose the Morley whopping, or I call it the wah pedal. So this one has a switch, and if you notice, the lights go on, and this dials in just how much wah you want. So if you're in this position, you have almost no wah, you have dry bass, and of course in this position, it's all wah-wah. It's totally what we call wet. In my setup, I tend to use almost all wet, but I want a little bit more dry. So this switch kicks it in. This Morley has no button. And what it does is the minute you step on it, it activates it. Now, if you can see the lights on it, it's right here. Notice when I touch it, it's on. When I let it go, it's off. So if I just want to do, like I told you, season a song, I come over, step on it, do what I have to do, and it's off. So this is more of an instantaneous, and also the chip in here is a lot deeper than this one, so I have two different tones, because a lot of times I'm hearing different things that I want instantaneously. It's a very short sound. Okay, that basically has what it is, and you can't really alter it. It's the chip inside. Hence, when I'm playing um, funk, I'll just step on it. And what it does is it adds to my actual plectrum in funk. So, all right. In comparison, the Morley over here has a complete different tone, and once again, no switch. So I don't have to worry about it. Listen to the tone. It sounds more rounder. It's a deeper tone. So hence, when I want to play a different sort of groove, it accentuates my harmonics. It accentuates the low notes. So not only is it good for not having the button, but it also gives me more of a wah. Next to here is what is known as the whammy pedal. This little toy I, I really like because what it does is on a bass guitar, if you were to put a whammy bar on it, it would take the bass completely out of tune and maybe even break strings. So what this does is in this position, in the black, it takes the bass up one octave or it takes the bass up two octaves, which you heard me demonstrating in the beginning of the video when the bass was screaming and screeching up there. And it gives you more of a guitar-esque type feel to the bass. When you go back this direction, you get more of a chorus. So it's a multifaceted pedal. You can do many things with it. And over here, of course, it's a, it's, a, it's a pitch shifter, which you can play in fits, forts, and do like a lot of different things. Incidentally, that are very popular with grunge bands and one of my favorite bands, King's X, and groups like that my trusty whammy. In this position, I told you it played pitch shifts. And what that does is when you use the, the pedal, it actually gives you almost as if you bent the note. So, listen to it. If you're playing in a country band or country bass for that matter, you can get that effect this way. Okay? And in that genre, there are plenty more of those things. I think you get the idea on that. I get a lot of colors with that in solos. When you pick it into D tune, put this all the way up, you get, you get no effect. But as you begin to depress the pedal, you get more of a chorus effect if you like to join your guitar player and fill this out. That sounds like. And of course, it goes all the way. You generally wouldn't want that much, so you just want to get just a little bit. Basically, the octaver, unlike this, 
You step on the entire pedal and it turns it on, again, indicated by here. This button is two octaves down. If you're playing a guitar, the more of this you use, the heavier the guitar gets. On the bass, it's already a low-pitched instrument and has a low timbre, so you don't want to use too much of that because it'll sound muddy. So what I tend to do is just give just a pinch for that raw sound. This is one octave. This is the one you can use. This takes you one octave down, and what it does, it gives that low growl. So this is one of my favorite devices to use. And this, of course, is wet, dry, the same as the Wawa. I use completely wet. As you're playing a song, take note. You want to add some bottom to the bass to round out the band. Out, in. comes in very useful, especially in trio situations when we're playing. Sometimes without a control, I'll have to add bottom. You just heard me use this pedal. This gives me a lot of shred. And when we're playing more metal and more heavy, heavy stuff, which is my preference to play, this gives me a shred almost guitaristic, but it takes me to another zone where I can get more bass because you can dial in with this the amount of volume, which is on every kind of pedal board actually every kind of uh, distortion unit. But here you can actually, it has a sweepable EQ, which means you have your highs, your mids, your lows, and your low mids. So I can, when I kick this in, normally with a, with a distortion you lose the bass. I can dial it then back in. Hence I chose the metal zone. So if you're hitting chords and your guitar player, sometimes Simon will play solos and I want to fill his space where he was, I'll step on a pedal. <laughs> freak out occasionally. So while I'm doing that, these are basically my array of effects and things that I'm using now. And uh, let me add that in choosing effects, don't choose them because someone else just chose them and they're popular. I would choose something that was personal to me. Like I told you, these particular array of pedals are what enhance my playing and what I enjoy to play with. You may have a different choice. But for now, let's go to the pedal board. Right now I want to talk about detuning and basically what, what I mean by that is the normal guitars and bass, well let's talk about bass, four string is normally tuned E, A, D, and G. Um, and on, of course on a, on a five string bass you have a lower string which is a B and a high C on a six string bass. But we're, we'll get on a four string now. Um, how that pertains to the music today, the way that actually started 
was a lot of bands say if they were in a different key, say other than E, and the song was in say E flat or D sharp, but rather than changing position of the hands, they would just actually change their tuning. How that pertains to today and where it's very necessary is if you're playing in a grunge band or if you're playing very heavy music, you want the absolute lowest possible tones that you can get. So in my case, a lot of times it affects keys. If I'm with Joe Cocker or someone and we're playing in D on the A string, and the line is, That's very funky and it's very cool. Or if I'm playing an eighth note groove, that's cool. But what I'm missing and why I like to play an E or a lot of people is because you have. So the way to get around that is if you're in D or C and you don't have a five string bass, is to take the D note if you're in D and, D and detune the E string. Now, you've taken your E string and you've dropped it down a whole step, which gives you that bottom. So, if I were to play the same lick now, so now you have the addition of the low note, which adds weight to the band. And when you have your guitar player and your drummer, you're able to go down in the sub octaves. band a lot more weight. Now another way to detune, and a lot of bands do this in particular, um, if you guys know them, Soundgarden is one of my favorites. King's X does a, a whole lot, and a lot more band. Alice in Chains, most bands now detune. And what that means is you take the entire bass, whereas you were in E, and you're down now here. So you take the whole bass down a whole step. this does is if I play in the same position, which is the E position, it is really D and it gives us a heavier tone. And the lower you go, the heavier the, the instrument is. Now, in detuning, you have to watch out because your action changes as you detune. So you'll have to set your instrument up but you can actually go as low as you possibly can and when you play the notes, it will be so heavy, Beavis and Butthead will never ever criticize you again. Okay, so, see? Now if you notice, the timbre of this instrument is getting like a lot heavier and a lot lower. So now I can take my octave, which I said. Yeah, I'll turn this down a bit. What that does is it creates that effect of absolute bottom. And when, when you're playing in a band and the, and the guitars are all tuned that way, it becomes a lot heavier and a lot louder, which is actually what we all want. So you probably recognize that sort of sound. That's exactly what they do. So if you're in the key of C sharp, you want to tune your instrument down that way or into B. So to recap, if you're doing it, on a record just to get the low note, you just want to tune the one string that you want to be low. If you're playing an absolute heavy music where you want the entire band to sound very low, you want to tune the entire bass down to that. Yeah! I have a message for all of you out there. You better listen to this, and I mean listen, and that's the key, what I'm trying to tell you. If you're playing in a band situation, before you try to play something, make sure you listen to what's being played, because that is part of the job and most of the job of a bass player. Peace. Message number two for all of you aspiring bass players and players in general.
if you don't work on your groove and you can play one million notes, you will get nowhere. The most important thing is the groove. Okay? If there's no groove, totomo me wa kune. Message number three to you young bass players, old bass players and bass players that are playing on the weekend. Whenever you pick up your instrument, always go at 100%, not 40%, not 99%. Even if you're practicing by yourself, always take it to the max. What I'm doing in the future is some of the hardest, heaviest, funkiest, fastest metal music that you might want to hear. In fact, we're taking all the faders to the top. So right now, get ready for us because it's unpretentious. It's on the bomb. It's Quasi Zeppelin, Hendrix, James Brown all roll into one. Get ready for it. Peace! And shit.
I'd like to uh, take time to thank all the wonderful people and uh, crew and staff here, Endo and the gang for uh, participating in this video. It's been an experience and a love. Music is not my career, it's my love. And just so happens to be my career. I'd like to thank T.C. Tolliver. I'd like to thank Simon Gregory, Tony Riggio and all the wonderful people, man. Stubbs back there for doing this. And right now we're going to do um, some different kind of stuff on the other side of the moon because music is a very, very vast and endless, endless region of, of, of things that's unexplored. And we'd like to show you some other kinds of things. And I won't even say the word jazz, just good, some good music. Over here we have Stanley Jordan on guitar. Who needs no introduction, mind you? We're all brothers. Back in the back we have Kenwood Denard on the drums. And right now, we'd like to enlighten ourselves as well as you. Thank you. <laughs> 